Forget frequently asked questions. Common sense. Common knowledge. Or Google. How about advice from a real genius? 95% of people in any profession are good enough to be qualified and licensed. 5% go above and beyond. They become very good at what they do. But only 0.1% a real geniuses. Richard Jacobs has made it his life's mission to find them for you. He hunts down and interviews geniuses in every field. Sleep science, cancer, stem cells, ketogenic diets, and more. Here come the geniuses. This is the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Before we begin, a note from our sponsor. I'm Richard Jacobs, Executive Director of the nonprofit Finding Genius Foundation and host of the Finding Genius Podcast. In late 2016, I was rear-ended at 65 miles an hour by a truck on the highway, which sent me off-road into a ditch. The impact of the collision gave me a concussion and other injuries. At the hospital, a CT scan showed that I had thyroid nodules, which turned out to be cancer. It was then, when I had a biopsy in my neck, that I realized, even if I was a millionaire, I wouldn't want a second or a third biopsy due to the pain and the invasiveness of it. And appointments at that time for thyroid experts were three to six months out. And I was worried about dying now, even if that was irrational. So because of this, I've decided to raise money to conduct a literature review on steroids, on the causes of anxiety and depression, a condition that affects well over 50 million people in the United States and hundreds of millions worldwide. Our goal is to create a codex, a guide that reveals all possible treatments for anxiety and depression for people that live with the condition or for loved ones that have it, as my wife and my son do. To find out more about our fundraiser, visit FindingGeniusFoundation.org and click on Current Initiatives. And now, to our guest. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Finding Genius Podcast, now part of the Finding Genius Foundation. Quick note about the foundation. Uh, we've embarked upon our massive literature review to create a, an AI-powered coach you know, for people that suffer from anxiety and depression. So to find out more about the effort, uh, go to FindingGeniusFoundation.org. And today, uh, in a similar vein, I have uh, Ellen Forney. She's a best-selling author, a TED Talker, uh, and a speaker. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, her New York Times best-selling graphic memoir, Marbles, Mania, Depression, Michelangelo, and Me, the story of uh, her diagnosis and struggle with bipolar disorder. So, And she also has written a book called Rock Steady. But we'll get into that. So, Ellen, thanks for coming. Happy to be here. Yeah, if you would, tell me a bit about your uh, your journey and your life and what you know, what got you into, um, you know, writing about bipolar depression, uh, you know, a little bit, of, little bit of your background, please. Right. Well, so in some ways a little circuitous, but a, kind of a back and forth thing. So I, um, I was diagnosed bipolar uh, shortly before I turned 30 and then struggled for, of course, that was after a few episodes of very, very acute mania and depression. And so then I was diagnosed and and had four years of real struggle to figure out how how to be stable. And so Richard, just like you, uh, one of the things that got me into what I'm doing now is my own personal experience. And so my own personal lived experience is a really big part of a lot of the different things that I do now. But I studied psychology when I was in college and then and then after graduating and working on a psychiatric unit, I decided that what where my passion was really was to be an artist. And so so I became a cartoonist and was a cartoon. I'm still a cartoonist, became a cartoonist. And then and then, like I said, I was diagnosed with bipolar. And so that became kind of where psychology and uh, my comics and art kind of uh, wove together. So I wrote this graphic memoir, like you said, Marbles, Mania, Depression, Michelangelo and Me, one of the most difficult, I guess, pieces of art that I've done. And so thankful that it really resonated with a lot of, with a lot of people. So that's my New York Times bestseller. And it is taught in a lot of schools and very satisfying for me in a lot of universities. And well, well, what was the, uh, what was taught in the book? What's it about? Well, so it starts out pretty quickly with my diagnosis. W one of the things that was really important to me in m putting together marbles is that it, it told my story, it told what that meant to me, what it meant to me as an artist to be struggling with bipolar and to have bipolar. And then other artists and writers through history who had mood disorders. What does creativity mean? 
So, and then I also made sure to put in a lot of tools. Like, for example, my therapist suggested that I look at some different exercises in cognitive behavioral therapy, which is sort of very analytical and you write things down. And so I tried some things out of that. Ultimately, it wasn't what I turned to, but there were some things that I found useful. And so in marbles, rather than just saying that I found them useful, I, I detailed what those were and kind of showed the reader how they might do it themselves. So I wove in a lot of tools for the reader as well. Is this for people particularly that have bipolar disorder or will it also address other mental disorders, depression, anxiety, et cetera, or is it just focused on bipolar? Well, there's a lot of overlap between bipolar and, and unipolar depression, like just, just depression. The, the experience of the depression is um, very similar with the lack of energy and the, the helplessness, hopelessness and just in pain, like the list of symptoms, uh, the official list of symptoms is, is the same. I think one of the things that makes bipolar sort of famously so difficult to treat is also needing to deal with the mania. So rather than just bringing, bringing a person's mood up, it also needs to be able to keep it down. And so being able to stay there in the, in the middle. But I think that one of, the, one of the things about any personal story about struggle, not even just mental health, but, but, uh, but, but struggle is something that a lot of people can get, can really relate to and any sort of over overcoming difficulties, internal difficulties, trying to figure out what different things mean to yourself and who am I? And if I'm going through all of these different changes, then, then this idea of who I was is and who I am, what is true. And, and I think those are the kind of questions that anyone has. And then some of them are more specific to people who are dealing with mental disorders, like what, what medications are work best for me? And do I want medications? And what kind of therapy? So there are some things that are specific to bipolar. There's some things that are specific to mental health. And there's some things that are just more universal. So what are some of the, uh, I don't understand bipolar very much. Um, I would think that there's a lot of misconceptions around it, a lot of you know, just to put it plainly, thinking the person is just nuts and people looking down <laughs> on someone that has bipolar. No, I'm, 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 you know, I'm, I'm not in the know on this. I'm just telling you, like, just what I, my guess is, like, what, what has been your experience? What do, what does the public think of people that have bipolar disorder? What are some of the misconceptions around it? Well, I think you're right that there is a preconception that bipolar is particularly difficult, makes a person particularly difficult to, to, to deal with. I, 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 I think that uh, there's a wide array of people who are, I don't know, I guess, I guess I'm not ready with an answer specifically to that. I, I think that um, what other people think of other people is very subjective and really depends on their experience. And certainly- Well, I mean, like, like, like your personal experience, you know, have you, have you been mistreated? Do you feel like, have you been misunderstood? Uh, you know, like what's, you know- right. you, it's up to you. You don't have to give details, but I mean, okay. in your own life with your own experience, like, have you had to deal with a lot of, again, just difficulty with, with other people because they don't understand or they have preconceived right. notions or like, like, how do you right. view it personally? Right. Well, I'd say, I'd say that I personally, personally have had a lot of advantages in my treatment and the communities that I am a part of. Um, the kind of resources that I have available to me. I have a, a, a loving, accepting family where therapy was kind of not, a, not outrageous. I am white, which makes a really big difference in the, in the kind of treatment that you can find and really connect with. And living in a city, I had a lot more options. So I think I, oh, and then also I'm an artist. And I think that being, or I know that being kind of a, a neurally typical is something that is, well, it's even romanticized. I mean, the problem really with artists more is the romanticization of being, you know, the crazy artist is, the, is that stereotype. 
Before we continue, I've been personally funding the Finding Genius podcast for four and a half years now, which has led to 2,700 plus interviews of clinicians, researchers, scientists, CEOs, and other amazing people who are working to advance science and improve our lives and our world. Even though this podcast gets 100,000 plus downloads a month, we need your help to reach hundreds of thousands more worldwide. Please visit FindingGeniusPodcast.com and click on Support Us. We have three levels of membership from 10 to $49 a month, including perks such as the ability to see ahead in our interview calendar and ask questions of upcoming guests, transcripts of podcasts you're interested in, the ability to request specific topics or guests, and more. Visit FindingGeniusPodcast.com and click Support Us today. Now back to the show. So I think that for me personally, it was extremely difficult, but it was, but it was, but I never really, I rarely run into the kind of stigma and difficulties that I know a lot of other people do in other communities and with other professions. I mean, that said, I mean, we're confronted with this stigma around mental illness all the time. Every time there is some horrible, like a mass shooting, all of a sudden there's all of this attention on the mentally ill being violent. And it's just a, a myth that continues. And that, that kind of, that kind of stigma is really the kind of thing where in my own life, it really just kind of pokes in every once in a while and kind of it can even take me by surprise. Well, um, I think I've heard you talk about this in, you know, either in your TED talk or other places, but what, what's it like being inside, you know, your head when you're manic versus when you're down and you give a little insight into people so that they can maybe get a, a little bit of a feel for what it's like to be you. I guess I'll have to say that, that probably the best way to really get into the ins and outs would, would be that it's complex and that to, to read, if you really want to get in there, that to read my book is probably where I really kind of like packaged it as carefully as I, as I, as I, as I could. And, and being manic is being, well, you know, everybody's experience is, is, is different and is a bit different. And that's, that's something that um, I just want to make clear is that my own experience is, is, is mine. And it's one of the things that's really important to me in my, in my work. Like you mentioned, I did a book rock steady and that's, it's the companion book to marbles. Uh, it's called rock steady, brilliant advice from my bipolar life. And it's a handbook on mental health and taking care of yourself. Well, like I was talking about how um, how marbles has all these different tools in it that I, I found that I got a lot of response from readers that they found those really useful. And I wanted to make sure that um, there was more as much information as I could put out there and and that there were there were enough options that people could really, um, really find what their own subjective life might um, call for. Like what, what, for, what for, for them, what kind of tools would work f for them? So are there necessary tools for both the depressed phase and the manic phase? Or is the manic yeah. phase just, it's so good that it just kind of takes care of itself or does it have its own problems? Oh, well, I mean, one of the one of the big things about mania is that it's uh, ultimately exhausting and it, it inevitably leads to a crash into depression, which it's one of the it's one of the most difficult parts of. Well, so this would get into why it's so difficult to treat, because because hypomania, which is mild mania, which is sort of like step one going up the stairs to, you know, an increased revving level, increased energy and decreased sleep. And it gets increasingly um, difficult to f function, really. If you like this podcast, please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. 
but in the beginning it just feels like you're very functional like things are really good but uh, keeping stable is something that um like keeping keeping up keeping everything in balance is something that is difficult for everyone i mean everyone has mental health you know everyone has emotions and so keeping everything in balance i think it's really become clear during the pandemic that keeping everything in, in balance is difficult for everyone and so i actually came up with a strategy i i, I felt like i you know like i i was gonna nail for when i was doing rock, rock steady um the different things that i that i thought have been really important to me in my staying stable and i've been stable now uh i've been stable now for 19 years 19 years um and so the things are i gave it i gave it an acronym because everything needs an acronym it's smedmert which is and so here are the different elements are sleep meds eat doctor mindfulness and meditation exercise routine uh coping tools and a support system and all of those things we need to consider all of those things in order to keep our um our mental health in in balance and it's a lot of different things and they're not always going to be we're not always going to be on top of everything but kind of keeping a bead on on all of those things this kind of holistic system is yeah what, um, I, what I don't hear is like just pop a pill you know or exactly. do one thing it's it's a lot of different things but do you give instruction on the you know smed bird side of, let's say there's like eight things in there or seven things um are there particular things people should do first or um like how do they approach it since there's so many things to be done right well i mean i guess blanket they're all really important but the but the most important one is sleep the most important one is sleep getting good sleep getting good regular sleep i think every everything you know like you can kind of you know kind of puzzle them out from there like which is the most important to you and what are the sticking points and and um what you know like what do the different things mean what does exercise mean to you you know kind of thing but sleep is bottom line what we all really need to make sure that we have kind of under our belts i guess but from but from there i think uh well a really important point that you just said is that it's not just a pill and I mean, you can, you can. I mean, I think that it's that it's really clear for for anyone who has only been given a prescription and no sort of follow up and no sort of treatment other than that that it doesn't work. That either it doesn't work or it doesn't work well, or there are side effects that make it un, unpleasant enough that you can't follow that that routine. I think not everyone who's. I mean, they, they you know talk to your doctor, but not everyone who is on meds really needs to be on meds and a lot of people maybe are not on the meds that would suit them best or maybe they could be on less meds if they paid had more i guess um information or practice with the other aspects eating eating well like good nutrition or meditation or exercising i mean you can read it, studies that show you know that uh, regular exercise increases people's you know d d solves some people's depression you know like they're all the, yeah, like right. with a, with any one of these points there's going to be some people who have done a study that shows that that is the most important thing to take care of yeah you said that you've been stable for 19 years does that mean that you don't have ups and downs or the ups and downs are more muted like what's it like for you well i would say that i work hard at taking care of my health and that i am an emotional person and that i really have to track if i'm you know like getting enough sleep and making sure that that i take that i pay attention if if i'm traveling say for example and i'm dealing with jet lag to to make sure that everything else is in place you know that i'm doing my yoga and getting enough sleep and eating the right times and yeah i haven't had an episode i haven't gotten manic or clinically depressed since 
2002. That's excellent. Yeah, that's a long time. It's fantastic. Um, I work hard. It's thing. I work. I guess. I guess. I guess I'll take that back. I work. I work hard in a way that has become just part of how I live. I guess you know, like. Okay like follow like following these like following these things and like you know sitting down and meditating for a little bit every day and that that kind of thing in a way that's work but it's it's also i've just kind of folded it in to who well I am it sounds like too. it sounds like a lot of the things you're doing are a part of being healthy no matter who you are or what you are so right. it, it sounds like it kind of forced you to live a healthier lifestyle and pay a lot more attention to it sleep and mood and eating and sunshine and exercise and you know all the things you identified in your in your acronym right. you know smenmer so right. right i guess it's right in a way it's a good thing do you see it that way have you ever thought you're glad that you had to deal with bipolar i know it's maybe a weird thing to say but like have you ever thought that or you just see it as like a like how do you see it do you see it as a curse do you see it as a burden do you see it as a good thing like how do you view it well it's a it's a mixture of a lot of things I mean, it's brought me to a place where I've been able to help a lot of people. You know, I hear from a lot of readers and TED Talk watchers and who who really have told me how important my books or my, my work or knowing that I've been stable for so long, how important that has been to them. I mean, I, I mean, I, I guess it must be the same for you that you've started a, a lot of this nonprofit and this podcast and a lot of your work and a lot of a lot of the compassion and understanding of life and struggles in your own life and your own work and so yeah. like going going through some sort of personal struggle and crisis and getting to the other end of it and figuring out how to make that struggle something that can be a positive for oneself like for me i take really good care of myself in a way that i wouldn't if i if i didn't have to and i wouldn't be in this position to help so many other people if i didn't have this experience and then the drive to um to share it yeah the reason why i said it and you know i'm not trying to turn this into me but like you know i had thyroid cancer and etc right I'm, I'm glad it happened it's a crazy weird things to say but mm -hmm. it turned my life to a better direction and I'm actually glad that it happened. So that's why I figured I'd ask you, maybe it's crazy to say I'm glad I had bipolar disorder, but I just wondered if you've ever thought that, if, if this is like a, a hidden blessing because it forced you to live in a lot healthier way. That's why right. I asked. In a way, I mean, and then there are a lot of other things too. I mean, I, I mean, it's not a, it's not a weird question. I've gotten that question a lot, or maybe it's a weird question I get a lot is if you could if you could like remove bipolar from yourself and your history would you do it and 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 i and i would say no for you know a variety of reasons and one of them is because it's it's me and it's who i am and it's how i understand myself and and i've come to to live in myself i guess you know a certain one of one of the one of the things that has been a driving force in my in my work is the is is that I want to help other people to accept themselves and accept other people that compassion for themselves and understanding for themselves and other people and yeah I, no, that's really important yeah yeah and that you you can't really take care of yourself um, unless you really feel like you there's a reason to love yourself that there's a reason to take care of yourself there's this thing in dialectical behavior therapy which is uh which is a kind of therapy that was developed primarily for um for people with by with um, borderline disorder which is basically an emotional dysfunction disorder like just uh let's just say emotional dysfunction disorder and it's this concept of radical acceptance and it's it kind of got a lot of different kind of ways of expressing it kind of be here now you know like meditating be here now like be in this moment and radical acceptance is basically kind of like that where just this is this is how things are right now like open your open your eyes i guess and and what's going on right now one, one, one example that is given a lot, just sort of an understand, kind of understandable is if you're in, if you're stuck in traffic, 
and, and you're stuck in traffic and you're trying to get to appointment and you're getting like really bent out of shape. And this is, it's starting to, you know, like, you know, like the whole day is going bad and, and, and getting angry and flipping off somebody. And that if you, if you can just like, whoa, wait, reveal it in like, so this is like, accept this moment. You're not going to change being stuck in traffic. You're not going to change that you're going to be late for your own appointment. So just chill a moment and figure out how you're going to be there now. Okay. Can you, you know, like, don't text while you're driving. <laughs> can you turn on Siri? Can you text and say, I'm going to be late? Can you just take some deep breaths? Because you're not going to make it any different by stressing out about it or relaxing there. You're not, you're still going to be stuck in traffic and then you can move forward. Then you can think, how am I going to move? How am I going to move forward from here? So that's, so that idea of, okay, you know, here, here I am in this situation. Here I am with this bipolar. I can't, you know, like it's not, let's say, let's say a, let's say I'm resisting it more. It's not fair. Why me? And I'm going to go do what I want to do regardless. Then, then it's really self-defeating and it's not going to serve me. Where this idea of, of accept, just like looking around me and accepting what's going on. Okay. I have this to deal with right now. Look, this is what I have to deal with. Now, what am I going to do? How, how am I going to be with this moment? And what am I, what am I, how am I going to move forward or how am I going to live with this? And it's a, and it's a much more balanced place to make decisions from than, than when you're, than when you're spinning and you can't really see what's going on. So if, if someone's, um, you know, has bipolar and they're like in the down phase or they're in the manic phase, uh, do you tell them like, don't make decisions when you're at one extreme or another, or you're like, is there any crisis advice for people that are like in the thick of it up or down or sideways like what, what can they do to get out of crisis mode so they can reflect a little bit on what's going on and pause and be able to help themselves instead of just reacting well i think you answered your question really and that's and that's true for true for anyone you know if if you're making big decisions you don't want to do it impulsively and you don't want to do it when you're under duress or then you'd maybe be doing it for the wrong reasons or not thinking like don't make big decisions when when you're not grounded you know like don't make your big decisions when you're not in a in a good place to be making big decisions so so yeah. it would be so it would be the it would be the same for if you're if you're really stressed out if you've been really sick if you're going through some trauma of of uh, the death of a loved one or i don't know a pandemic perhaps or anything that is that has thrown you into crisis state then you know making big decisions at well, that point is uh, tricky well it may be easy for me to say because i'm not in that state right now and you know thank god i don't usually get into that state but for someone that is in that state what do they do if, if like the emotions and everything are really intense and they're ruminating. So therefore they're reviewing a lot of things that go on in their life. And the temptation will probably likely be to make decisions on it. I don't want to do that anymore. You know, so-and-so, I don't want to see them anymore. You know, how do you hold all that back when you're in, let's say a very heightened emotional state? And, you know, like what kind of tools can you use to, to help you when you're at your most, you know, up or down? Right. Well, it sounds like, Maybe what you're asking is how do you how, like how do you reel how do you reel yourself in and it's really it's really so there are a couple of things in in there where ho hopefully you are hooked up with some treatment whether it's a therapist or let's say a psychiatrist or someone who would be able to talk you through or or otherwise help you through some of the some of the really the thick of some of that, but a lot of it, you know, a lot of it we can we can do ourselves with just cal calming ourselves down. I I have a I have a lot in rock study of of coping tools and things that you can do, breathing exercises and doing doing your art. You know, it's like wait a second, go go play your guitar, you know, like or go listen to music, like things that you can do to. That you can, I, I, I kind of think of it as things that you that you can bring in, like you can 
you can read or you can watch something or you can l listen to music or things that you can do out more active, like go for a walk or call a friend or meditate, or there are different things that you can do to, to calm yourself. And then, you know, there, there are different things in uh, treatment that, that can be, that can lead to that, that can help also. Again, like dialectical behavior therapy has a, has a lot of tools for, for really heightened emotions. One that is really helpful, and this is really helpful for a lot of people, and I'll just, I'll just say this one out because it's so interesting. It's called, it's called the mammalian diving reflex. And what it is, is that if you put your face into really cold water, if you hold your breath and put your face into really cold water, so either a basin of really cold water, the sink or a, or a bowl, maybe with some ice in it, but really cold, hold your breath and put your, put your face in it, it um, it calms down your system. It slows down your heart rate, and it's very it's very calming. It, it's this biological thing. It has to it happens to all mammals, and it has to do with like the reason it's called diving reflex is like seals and penguins. You know, it's it's this really fascinating biological thing. Anyway, so dialectical behavior therapy has has a, a lot of tools for calming down, and there are many many more drawing exercises. I I, I have. I have, a, I have a whole chapter of coping tools in, in Lack Study. Oh, cool. Cool. Yeah. What kind of feedback have you gotten that really like, you know, made you raise your eyebrow either from Rock Study or, or Marbles? Well, I have been, I have just been so that it has appealed to so many different people. The, I think the, the medium of comics is really, really powerful. One, one of the things that I discovered after having put out marbles is that there's this whole field called graphic medicine about uh, comics, about health and, and healthcare. And so I've gotten to be able to really think a lot about how it is. I did a, a curated a, an exhibit for the National Library of Medicine on, on graphic medicine, focusing on memoir, but not entirely, some other things too. So, so comics are really powerful medium for especially for expressing an internal internal life so showing in oh. art how something how something feels oh that's example. a really cool idea so you and, so it's right. like creating a comic of someone that's you know again in a very depressed mood or a very manic mood for instance and like the comic kind of reveals the inner thoughts of the situation and people get therapy by reading it is that what you mean well, well, yeah. I mean, if you think if you think about, uh, let's say, a famous one, the scream. So that's monk, uh, the you know, like hands up on the face, and like oh, and there's an emoji, and that was that was actually a painting that he did about a psychotic break of his, and that and so I think a lot of what reads so clearly to to people, even if they don't really think about it very hard about you know where that it was actually someone's psychotic break but it really shows this kind of fear and and a certain kind of agony and and art can do that art can really express a, a feeling in a way that's very immediate and so and so comics like marbles and rock steady is a uh, is in comic form also really gets at the uh, combination of those, you know, the specificity that you get in words and some of the abstract quality that you get in art. And then, you know, you know, kind of gets back and forth with very spe specifics in, in, the, in the, the, the combination is really powerful. I, I guess I would say also about comics and about my marbles and rock studies specifically is that they are a lot of people have told me that they were the first books that they had read cover to cover in years and some of that has to do with trying to focus when you're in an agitated mood state which is would be deep mania and depression is you know it's hard to focus it's one of the things that is actually interestingly interestingly to me thing is that there is actually a fair bit of overlap between mania and depression and some of it is that frazzled lack of focus 
And so comics have a lot of base. If you if you think about having a hard time focusing and, and trying to look at a at a page of it's just like ants crawling all over the page. I mean, it's just like words wind up just being too dense and small where there's just more space on the page. There's drawings and it's just a lot more approachable to read a story, even a difficult story in comics. I was, I was picturing, um, you know, like hiring a comic artist and, you know, for X number of important points in a given book, like making mm -hmm. a comic book companion. Mm -hmm. you know, to review like the top concepts. Is that what you've done with your book? Well, mine are more, I mean, they're comic. So the Rocksteady, okay. Rocksteady has, uh, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a guide. And so there's a lot more words in it, but it's all handwritten and there's still a lot of space. And, and one of the things that I, I don't know, it's just, it's just how I explain things and how I live and express things is with humor and approachability. Like I was told that that reading my work is like reading a letter from a friend. And that's the the kind of feel that I that I aim for. Yeah, and that's that, really and, cool. that's right. and that that's the kind of so so one of the things that also that came from you know, I, I said that I came from, you know, like I studied psychology and then comics and then uh, then a, a cartoonist, and then they came together in doing these, um, you know, my graphic memoir and this this mental health guide. Is that is that it's kind of like taken that beyond, kind of like back in a way into more of a more of a focus on mental health specifically, which is um, being a mental health coach, and it's specifically about Rocksteady and Smedmerts, the sleep meds eat the acronym that i was talking about where i work with people in um their own their self their own self-care and putting those putting those together you should, into, you should get a sticker for mess. your books that say warning contains graphic images but in a good way with a little smile <laughs> well you know you know people are used to hearing graphic novel and graphic memoir now and they don't think graphic like explicit you know like like mature material only but it w in the beginning before the those terms became common it was it it did get it did confuse a lot of people that it really seemed like graphic novel meant like you know like for mature audiences only yeah but it's funny your novels literally do have graphic images so it'd be funny if you right. worked that in there you know in the right future. right yeah. sure yeah well, very cool. Well, Ellen, um, so both of your books are available in what formats and where can people find out more about, you know, your work and you and your books, et cetera? Where do they go? Well, so my books, um, Marbles, Mania, Depression, Michelangelo and Me, so that's my graphic memoir, is available pretty much anywhere books are sold. So it's on Amazon and and also any independent bookstores, really, most of them will have them actually. And um, rock steady, brilliant advice from my bipolar life, and that's my mental health guide. And those are both also available as ebooks. I highly recommend them as paper books. Just get, I think you know comics are work best on paper. My my own personal opinion, but those are available as ebooks as well. And have you my, thought about um, making like a video? of the books since you know since one of them at least is a graphic novel it might be cool to have it animated as a video too companion that would be kind of beyond my skill set animation is really a, a lot of work somebody somebody was was talking with me for a for a bit this wound up not happening about making marbles and music and i think that it would be awesome to be able to introduce these material to a different audience like that a non-specifically comics reading audience but a also a musical theater audience and then i'll add i'll add to that my uh my coaching you can find at rocksteadycoach.com like the book rocksteady rocksteady coach and i am starting a newsletter happy to be starting a newsletter and so if any of your listeners are interested in signing up for my newsletter they can do that rocksteadycoach.com. Okay. Well, very cool. Well, and thank you for coming on. 
and for, you know, talking honestly about your situation and for the work that you do. So thank you for being here. Thanks for inviting me. I appreciate it. All right. You take care. If you like this podcast, please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. You've been listening to the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. If you like what you hear, be sure to review and subscribe to the Finding Genius Podcast on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. And want to be smarter than everybody else? Become a premium member at FindingGeniusPodcast.com. This podcast is for information only. No advice of any kind is being given. Any action you take or don't take as a result of listening is your sole responsibility. Consult professionals when advice is needed.